I'm Micah. My pronouns are she, her. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about a political framework that has become increasingly salient in light of the rise of far-right political regimes in the US and Europe. Now, the title of my concentration is Kinship in the State. And I'm, tonight, I'm going to explain my usage of kinship and show different ways it can emerge politically. So when we talk about kinship, generally, we're talking about the family. But it's important to recognize its impact on larger communities as well. So when I talk about kinship, I'm talking about a web of relationships, of everything from the intimate and interpersonal to the abstract and imagined. The family should be seen as a microcosm of the nation, and the nation should be seen as an extrapolation of the family. And communities function as an intermediary, bridging the gap between the two. In this way, these levels of relationships are interdependent on one another. Let me explain what I mean. So nationalism. Benedict Anderson has been foundational in my understanding of nationalism and nations. Now he views the nation as an imagined political community. This thinking is useful for me insofar as it recognizes that we are constantly recreating the imaginary nation through acts of nationalism. And while I may not feel deep horizontal comradeship with everybody in the United States, or even everybody in this room, as he might suggest, it's, it's helpful because it shows us that these actions of nationalism exist in our interpersonal relations. The institutions in our society are rife with the language and practice of kinship. Big brothers, big sisters. Brotherhood of Teamsters. Big brother. Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. <laughs> Fraternities, you get the idea. So, <laughs> it's clear that kinship is pervasive in our social institutions. That almost seems redundant. But what we should pay attention to are the powerful cultural meanings that words like big brother invoke. Now, we might assume that it's the family that provides for us the definition of what it means to be a big brother. But we see that this definition is appropriated by the nation. Now this creates a dialogue between the levels of relationships. And now the meaning of big brother is defined not just by the family, but the nation as well. And this is what it means to be a part of kinship. Now what worries me, and what adds some urgency to my inquiry into kinship, is the ways that this relationship can develop in dangerous ways. So what's so dangerous about this lady? other than the fact that she wants to stop teaching the Holocaust in German public schools. Well, <laughs> if you've been paying attention to the news lately, you might be aware of the rise of far-right parties and movements in Europe and the United States. She's from Alternative for Deutschland in Germany. Now, kinship for me has been an extraordinarily, extraordinarily useful framework in unpacking these movements. Brexit was ultimately about who the people in the UK saw as kin. This is taken at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville last summer. Now, I've been watching these movements very closely for a number of years, from fringe online communities to having political legitimacy in the highest reaches of federal governments. And analyzing these movements pushed me to think about the foundational violence of an act of kinship. It's so important to remember this, that every act of inclusion is also an act of exclusion. That by signifying your kin, you're also signifying the other. Now, white nationalism is definitely an example of this. I would say that they define themselves primarily by exclusion. In fact, I would say that their definition in relation to the other is so crucial to their ideology, but Aren't all acts of kinship this way? Well, how do, we break, how do we break down white nationalism with kinship? So without delving into their ideology too much, let's look at their 14 words that serve as a sort of mission statement. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Well, <laughs> white nationalism invokes nation. Our people invokes community and white children invokes family. But what are the broader ideological implications for weaponizing kinship in such a way? 
So white nationalism might be a really easy target for this kind of analysis, but as I said, all kinship can be violent or exclusionary. While it's important to practice this kind of analysis on something like white nationalism, we see it manifest in political movements that are supposed to be inclusive. Like this one <laughs> at the Women's March this past year. Now, I named my talk after the blood and soil chant because I think it further goes to show how rooted white nationalism is in kinship. Blood invokes family and community as far as race, and soil invokes nation, citizenship, birthright. So it seems like the danger and violence that is married to kinship is inescapable. Can we redefine the parameters of our relationships? Well, we've tried. And a useful historical example for me of an attempt to do this is the Soviet Union. Now, Comrade had a lot going for it, but in my opinion, it failed to change the fundamental social hierarchies that existed in that society. It had a lot of radical potential, but what's so radical about presenting a national image of a family that looks like this? Or invoking the motherland and Stalin, essentially a national father figure in times of war. It seems to me that it isn't just enough to change the language of kinship, but kinship has to be changed in practice as well. So I've applied this kinship analytic to some varied examples. But what about us, US us? What about our founding fathers or Uncle Sam? Or what about the ways that brotherhood can emerge and justify violence and imperialism? And who's excluded from a national image of a family that looks like this? And what kinds of violence and genocide are we willing to sweep under the rug that predate practices of kinship like this? Now, my family, we sit around our Thanksgiving table at our practice of kinship and denounce white nationalism while forgetting the genocide of Native Americans that made our kinship and Thanksgiving possible. Benedict Anderson says that nations are founded on a foundational violence that is forgotten in time. I don't think we're an exception. I've painted a pretty bleak picture, but believe it or not, I still have hope. <laughs> because as, as, as oppressive or violent as this feels, it doesn't have to be this way. Our kinship doesn't have to look like this. Maybe it can look like this or whatever. The possibilities might be endless. Navigating this space is not impossible. For me, it just requires what I call deliberate kinship. Because if we want to change the world, we need to talk about what we're going to change specifically. Otherwise, kinship might just reemerge in unforeseen violent ways or just reproduce the inadequate ways of old. Queer theory has been very helpful in developing this analytic. For me, queerness isn't just about queerness. It's about futurity, and it's about critique. From Judith Butler's 1993 essay, Critically Queer, she says that queerness must never attempt to fully describe those it seeks to represent. Now, paraphrasing, she says that queerness must never rest in its traditions, and that the younger generation always has to come along and redefine what queerness means so that it will always be more inclusive of their identities. Queerness doesn't just refer to the queer community. It refers to a dynamic, self-critical mode of critique. And I think our kinship has to be the same way. It has to be flexible. It has to be dynamic. It has to be queer in order for it to accommodate the dynamic nature of people. Now, when we invest in chosen communities and we recognize that there are many ways to care for one another, we can begin to disentangle our relationships from violence and exclusion. When I think about the potential for kinship, I imagine a world where people feel a connection to one another just based on the fact that we're alive together. And I think that it can be this way, as long as we are mindful of ourselves and our actions. We can't change the world in a day, 
and we probably can't change it in a year, but think about what's possible in a generation. Thank you.